If you were to ask me to sum up our science of mind teaching, I would tell you that fundamentally for me, the science of mind is a spiritual practice, kind of like meditation or prayer. It's the spiritual practice of applying a consciousness of wholeness to our lives. That's what the science of mind is. It's about applying a consciousness, a perspective of wholeness to every aspect in our lives. It can begin right here in the present moment with an awareness of the divine, with cultivating a appreciation and gratitude for what is, and then we're, we, we're all of a sudden expanded. We're up on water skis and enjoying our lives. It's the prayerful nature of looking ahead at our life, our relationships, what we want to experience, and, and seeing that wholeness in, in the grist of all of it. And it's also embodying the spirit of forgiveness by looking at our past, those seemingly broken or fractured places, those times where we forgot the truth of who we are, those times where we may have been victimized by another person. You know, you can't change the past, but you can change your relationship with the past and have a different experience. And that's one of the greatest gifts this teaching has given me, this ability to have this extra layer of awareness that seeks to see through the eyes of spirit, that seeks to see even my most challenging moments in the spirit of unconditional love, not trying to sugarcoat them, but to realize everything came together for the story of my success, the story of God in my life. Ernest Holmes said, I now permit the spirit within me to express itself in freedom, bringing increased joy and harmony into my experience. I allow the divine wholeness to flow through me into ever-widening fields of activity, bringing peace where there was confusion, joy where there was discord. I silence my turbulent thoughts and direct my attention to the acceptance of God's perfect action in my experience. As I do so, all power is delivered unto me, and this I use for my own and everyone's good. A consciousness of wholeness, a panoramic view, the releasing of stories filled with judgment and opening to the story of God's grace in my life. What a gift. And our way in science of mind is to apply this conscious of wholeness to our self-image, to our relationships, to our finances, to every area of our lives. And I'm going to invite and, yes, indeed, challenge us today to apply this consciousness of wholeness to our country, to the United States of America. And it might be challenging. I'll explain why. Because it involves, first of all, looking back at all of our history under every rock, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, and learning with high consciousness, not to say any of the bad things were good, but how all of these things have shaped our ability to be successful in the future. It's our ability to right here and right now honor the sacredness of our country. This isn't easy for those in this sanctuary or watching at home who felt slapped by the Supreme Court decision last week. It's not easy for those who might feel the economy or inflation is out of control or that partisan bickering has got us so polarized that there's no good future for our country or that personal liberties are being infringed upon. These can, can keep us from seeing that wholeness here or now. But I'm calling us today to see it. It's looking forward at the future of our country and being able to declare and know that our future is going to be greater than our past. It takes optimism, it takes heart, it takes courage, and it takes that practitioner consciousness that we all have as practitioners of this teaching to see the wholeness no matter what is taking place. I find this myself by studying great Americans who did incredible things for their country. I think of Benjamin Franklin, who was an American but spent a large amount of his life in England. He preferred it there. 
he initially preferred the colonialism that was taking place, but eventually he kind of found a, a, an arrogance there, and there was a small amount of land, and there were so many people there that he started to look at these 13 colonies with these primitive folks, and this huge frontier, both of land, but to potentially of the consciousness for freedom around them. And he would say, the noblest question in the world is what good may I do in it? The noblest question in the world is what good can I do in it? What a great question for our lives. The noblest question is what good can I do for the world today? What a great question for our country. What good can we do in the world today? And I would argue that where we as Americans have asked ourselves that question, what can I do in our world to expand freedom, to expand liberty, we have succeeded brilliantly and beautifully. But where we have sought to create freedom for some at the expense of others, we have failed. We have stumbled, sometimes taking years, decades, centuries to recover and to heal. Another great American of the last century was uh, Thurgood Marshall, the first black Supreme Justice of the United States, did some, some, some significant things on the court, but he was one of those where, where uh, the, the court led a direction. So he only had so many impacts. His, his real impact happened as the lead counsel for the NAACP. And here was a man who saw the law being used against him and his fellow black Americans, and yet found also in that law the key to creating greater equality and justice in the country. This weird kind of contradiction. He was a civil rights leader, but he wasn't a protester. He was a lawyer. And so he brought his knowledge of the law and almost single-handedly with the help of others, but, but really so powerfully got rid of separate but equal from our justice system. Got rid of <laughs> segregation in our legal system and Jim Crow and brought this presence that, that led, this belief that when we live together, integrated, we can achieve great things as America. No separation. In 1960, Marshall was invited to go to Kenya, a country that was seeking its independence from British rule to help them write a new constitution. And Marshall, he came there and he studied all the great Constitutions. He was here in Kenya, and this is what he said. He said, when I did the Constitution for Kenya, I looked over just about every Constitution in the world just to see what was good. And there's nothing that comes close to comparing with this one in the United States. This one is the best I've ever seen. When he got to Kenya, there were some very strong white British guards there, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people who came to see Marshall so excited he was there, and he asked the guards if he could give a brief speech, and they said, absolutely not. He said, well, can I just say one word of, of greeting? And Marshall was a pretty big guy, and he got up on a station wagon, and he declared, you huru, you huru, and the crowd erupted. They went ballistic with joy. You huru meaning freedom now. Freedom now. Another great American of the last century was, was Robert Kennedy. Many saw him as a golden boy, but he was a sly politician when he worked a, under his brother in the Justice Department. And his, when his brother, President Kennedy, once commented that he believed that every Marine and, and really everyone in his cabinet should be able to walk 50 miles in a day, Robert listened. He didn't set out a press release. He didn't put anything on social media. He and his aides went, and he hiked 50 miles that day. It took him 17 hours. And the press got word that this was going on, and they all surrounded him. And he said he had a wonderful time, but he would never do that in dress shoes again. <laughs> but it's a great embodiment of the tenacity of the American spirit. You know, some of the greatest speeches in American history, there was little to no time to prepare for. And Robert Kennedy, for me, gave one of those speeches on April 4th, 1968. It was the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed. And for many people, he was campaigning for president at the time. He was in Indiana. And for many people, the first that they heard of this terrible event in American history was from him on that day. I have bad news for you, he said. 
for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and killed tonight. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice for his fellow human beings, and he died because of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence there evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in great polarization, black people amongst black, white people amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that has spread across our land with an effort to understand with compassion and with love. He goes on, what we need in the United States is not division, What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence or lawlessness, but love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or they be black. And and it was synchronistically terrible in a sense, but he, he was so the right person to share that message, not because of the color of his skin, but because he uniquely knew what it was like to have someone he loved murdered in such a terrible and awful way. He knew what it was to lose someone who represented his brother, such hope to so many people in America. And of course, tragically, months later, he himself would be shot and killed. And it makes you wonder, was he right? Those words that I just shared, were they right? That the way is not hatred and lawlessness, but love and compassion. Seeking to understand, recognizing that when we separate part of America, we're leaving something out. We don't have to like all the ideologies. We don't have to like partisanship. We don't have to like it, but we have to love her people and seek to come together for a greater light and a greater life and a greater way for you and for me and for everyone every member of our human family. In 1966, Robert Kennedy was invited to go to South Africa, which was in the grips of apartheid. We, he was part of a country that was moving past its own caste system, moving past Jim Crow, moving into a place to speak in South Africa that would take two decades and a little bit more to realize integration in their country. And he said to the people of Cape Town. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. If you're not seeing the ripples of hope that spread across our nation through good people every day, you're not paying attention. I know we don't hear about them on the news all the time, but I know there are so many good Americans and people everywhere through good acts, through practicing compassion, through speaking their truth, through having their anger constructively, that send those ripples of hope that can overcome even the mightiest walls of injustice even the mightiest enemies of freedom, even the mightiest ideologues that would seek to separate or to dismiss the greatness of the institutions and the intention behind them in our country. It is my opinion that what we need in our country more than anything is a whole story, a whole story. We need less punditry and more unity. We need less conspiracy theory and more leadership and accountability. We need, to, we need to get back to center from the loudest parts of the fringes and return to that silent majority that lives and moves and has its being as the spirit of God and the spirit of America 
that I believe is ingrained in each and every one of us. That ripple of hope that recognizes that when we see the whole story, we see it in alignment with a greater vision for who we can be. It doesn't mean everything in our story is good. In fact, a lot of it is awful and challenging and difficult, and it takes courage to look at the flaws in your country's history in the eye and to become better because of them. You know, there are some that would say that our country was founded by privileged white men, many of whom owned slaves, and many uh, were womenizers as well. And you'd be historically accurate. I'm not disagreeing with you. However, what I would argue is it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. It's one thing to say that America was invented by men. It's another thing to say that we are invented by the spirit of America. That America was an idea that time had come and the evolution of human consciousness that seeks greater freedom and liberty to live our very teachings in our heart. And of course we stumble. Of course we screw up. Of course we are challenged and it takes so much time and so much hard work. But it's there if we claim it and we own that spiritual birthright. It is the spirit of America that possessed John Adams to defend redcoats in early America being spited by all his fellow citizens because he believed in the right to a fair trial. It is the spirit of America that possessed Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence that, yes, wasn't true for everyone at the time and arguably may not be true for everyone now, but is our guiding prayer, our guiding star, our guiding ideal to continue to seek to make that liberty, justice, and pursuit of happiness for all. It is perhaps that same American spirit that brought both of these men who despised each other for the most part, by the way, to die on the very same day, and I believe it was 1826, the day, 4th of July, Independence Day. It's kind of an eerie story, but it's meaningful to me that about a week before Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he shared that he had a dream. And in his dream, he was in the White House and there were people there and they were all sad and he walked into a room and there was a coffin there and he asked, who died? And they said, the the president, he's been assassinated. It's kind of a dark story, but it speaks to me of all of those individuals who've been a part of the whole story of America, who've given their lives, given their lives for the whole story of America our brave service men and women, our brave civic and business leaders, brave citizens willing to give their life for this greater freedom for all. A whole story, a spiritual story for me is something that's planted in each one of us so that it may happen, so that it can come about. Each of us in our individual life, I believe all of our potential is in us like that beautiful acorn. We get to listen to it. We get to nurture it. We get to choose how much we bring about, but the whole darn thing is always there. And I believe that's true for our country, that it still has its potential, that it still has its heart, that it still has its vision, but it needs you and I to remember what it is. And that's, that's the, the calling of us as practitioners of this truth, practitioners of this teaching to to remember the truth. And even on the most difficult days, and we have had some difficult days recently, to be able to be angry, to be upset, to get right in the fight, go for it. But to hold that higher truth, not just for your country, but for your fellow man and fellow woman and fellow everybody in between. To bring a ripple of hope and to be a point of light. Be a ripple of hope and be a point of light. Ripple of hope, Kennedy brings us in 1966. Point of light, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, 1988. A thousand points of light. He spoke of the volunteer and the service person, the good citizen, and how powerful each of us can be a point of light that brings something sacred and precious about for our lives in our country. He would say, we can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves, a shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. 
We all have something to give. What do you have to give? Normally, I might close a talk like this with a few words of Joshi advice for you, but I'm going to, again, turn to another great American and his rules for leadership. His name's General Colin Powell, and we lost him last year. And before I say that, the part of why I wanted to bring this in is, is American pragmatism. We are supposed to be a pragmatic people. And, and this may sound a little bit, to some of us, where we may be right now as a kind of a patriotic or spiritual bypass, but I, I share it anyways to offer how we might encounter the days of head as enlightened citizens. Here are his rules for leadership. One, it ain't as bad as you think. It will look better in the morning. Two, get mad, then get over it. Three, Avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. Four, it can be done. Five, be careful what you choose. You may get it. Six, don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. Seven, you can't make someone else's choices. You shouldn't let someone else make yours. Eight, check small things. Nine, share credit. Ten, remain calm. Be kind. 11, have a vision, be demanding. 12, don't take counsel of your fears or naysayers. 13, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Don't be a puddle of spite, be a ripple of hope. Don't be a lightning rod for contention, be a point of light. Don't be a multiplier of pessimism. Be a multiplier of optimism. You never have to turn a blind eye to the facts or to your experience of what is taking place in our country, but we can remember our truth. And it's up to us as citizens to carry that truth with us and to seek to express it with one another. Your ripple of hope, your point of light, you are valuable. Your country needs you. Moving into prayer this morning, I invite you to join me if you so choose. I invite any of our prayer practitioners who choose to stand, to stand with us as well, holding consciousness for us. And there's something so sacred about our country and that we honor the sacredness in the individual, the heart of each one of us, the seed of God, designed to prosper, to heal, to grow, to expand, to embody freedom, that very quality of the divine itself. Let us recognize that sacred seed in each of us, knowing that as we live from this seed and seek to take freedom from no one else, we begin to not only prosper in our own lives, but to be a a blessing to others. And for those of us who may be experiencing hurt or frustration or anger at actions or situations going on in our country, remember that there is nothing, no system more powerful than the one implanted in your very heart that knows the truth of who you are and knows the truth that true freedom can never be taken. But we must embody it. We must live for it. We must choose it. We must fight respectfully for it. We must bring forth the best in ourselves so that we can bring forth the best of our nation. Giving thanks for all of the lives who've given themselves to this experiment called America, I give thanks for each and every person here, for the ripples ripples of hopes they bring and for the point of light that they are. You are a point of light delivering ripples of hope wherever you are wherever you go. And so it is.